So today we're going to continue our study of random and getting into simulation. So starting out with um, with a, a comic strip here. So the tour of accounting from Dilbert. Over here we have a random number generator. Nine 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 nine. Are you sure that that's random? Uh, that's the problem with randomness. You can never be sure. So hope you enjoy that. All right, so what are the properties of random? So the properties of random is that no one can predict, we know what can happen, but no one can predict what actually will happen. So whether it's flipping a coin, rolling a dice, drawing a card, we don't know uh, what's going to actually happen. Uh, so to help you better understand random, I compiled 11 random slides just for you. And I bet you won't be able to predict what's gonna happen next. For instance, the color purple, pizza, the smell of red, the force, Baby Yoda. Movie references. Would I rather be feared or loved? Easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. Love that, just absolutely love it. And Ron Burgundy over here, very classy man, San Diego. I don't know how to put this, but I'm kind of a big deal. I feel like those two sometimes. How about them Yankees? The weather, Steve Carell, common theme. What is love? I don't know. Don't hurt me. Golf. Electric cars. And most importantly, celebrity lookalikes. You're welcome. All right, so how do we generate random numbers? So we talked about three different methods used in games, whether it's rolling a dice, spinning a spinner, or drawing a card. Uh, those are ways that we can uh, generate random numbers. So pseudo random numbers, or that's how we generate random, not necessarily random numbers uh, when it comes to colors in the spinner. Uh, pseudo random is whenever we, uh, we have things that satisfy a test for randomness, but it's actually coming from a computer program or something like that. So it's not actually truly random, but it satisfies all the tests that we have for random. So whether it's coming from the computer or the internet, uh, a table of random numbers or the calculator, like we saw yesterday, we all, since it was seeding at the program at the same place, we all have the same random numbers. So a cereal manufacturer wants to boost the sales of their cereal boxes. So they decide to uh, randomly place these playing cards into them, uh, into each box. So uh, LeBron James card was placed into 20% of the boxes. 30% of the boxes were placed with uh, Danica Williams, or sorry, Danica. A cereal manufacturer company wanted to boost their sales by uh, putting these promotional uh, playing cards into their cereal boxes. So in 20% of the cereal boxes, they placed the LeBron James card. Danica Patrick was put in 30 of them and Serena Williams was put into half of the playing cards. So the question we might ask is how many boxes would it take for us to get all three, to collect all three? So the, the hopes is that people would go out and buy more cereal um, than they would typically buy um, in order to try to collect all of the all of the playing cards if that boosts their sales and it would be worth it right so we could go out to the store um, as a class and we could buy a hundred boxes of cereal and then we can open them up one at a time and we can simulate um, well in a way we could basically figure out okay well how many did it take for us to get to collect all three and then we would simulate that we would have one of them um, and then the length of the, the trial length would be how many boxes it took before we collected all three then we could start over again and do another one until we collected all three etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but the problem with that is well it's wasteful and it's expensive and um, there's really no need to do that so we can actually use random numbers to run a simulation instead of having to do it um, in person even though you guys probably would would really enjoy um, doing that but that's okay so we're going to basically use uh, random integers in order to run simulation which will answer the question of how many boxes would it take to get all three simulation uses random numbers to represent the outcomes of real events so if 20 percent uh, we're going to use the digits zero all the way to nine because all of our percentages end in a zero and so we can basically for each one of those um, numbers like zero and one that both of those would be a 10% chance of getting, right? And so together that would give us 20%. So we're gonna assign zero and one to the LeBron. Uh, the numbers two, three, and four are gonna be assigned to Danica, that would be 30%. And then the remaining five would go to Serena Williams, which would be uh, 50%. So the random integers we're using are from zero to nine, and for each digit from our random number table, and that will be, give us our assignments of 20, 30, and 50%. So we're not equally as likely to get any every card. That's why we have to assign a different number of these random integers to mean that we got a LeBron or a Danica or a, or a Serena Williams. 
Okay, so each time we, we obtain a simulated answer is uh, called a trial. So the length of our trial is going to be how many boxes or how many numbers did we have to go until we got one of each kind. Uh, our simulation, um, for our simulation, the trial's outcome is going to be the number of boxes. Um, so that would be the length of the trial. And then the outcome is called the response variable. That's what we're going to be graphing along the y-axis. Remember our explanatory variable and our response variable? The response variable is the one that we're interested in, and that's going to be the number of boxes it took before we collected all three. And each event of the trial is the component. So every time we open a box or we look at another integer uh, from our random integers, that's going to be the next component. Okay, then the, you have the outcome of the components as well. So. Okay, so here we have our random integers here, 89064, uh, 2730. So these are going to be, uh, I think there's actually something. No, I think I resorted those out. Okay, no big deal. Because normally these are sorted in groups of five, but it looks like I rearranged them so you could split them up in each trial. But anyway, so the eight, the first one we got would be a Williams. The nine is another Williams. So we already had a Williams, so we're not interested in that. Then the zero would be a LeBron. And then the six would be another Williams, so that's not important. And then the four, four would be a Danica. So this, now we have all three. So we have our Williams, our LeBron, and our Danica. Um, and so that, that would be our first trial, so trial number one. And the length of the trial was five. So we would record this as uh, five. So it took five boxes for us to collect all three. So the shortest we could ever collect all three would be in three boxes, right? But, but is that what's typical? Is that what we could expect? Well, certainly not. It's going to take more than three, but how much more than three? You know, that's what we're trying to simulate. So then we start over. Uh, our, another, our next trial starts out with two, which is a Danica, seven, which is a Williams. Three is another Danica, but that doesn't matter because we already had one. And then zero would be LeBron. So this was pretty short. This was a, our second trial only had four. So we only had to buy one extra box, right? Um, then the three that we, the minimum. So that's actually not too bad. Then the next one, we started out with eight with a Williams. Six was a Williams again, but that's not important. Uh, four would be another Danica. And then we have a Williams, Williams, Williams. And then finally, we get LeBron. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this uh, third trial had a length, a response variable of seven. So that's the, the length of the number of, uh, of components before we finally got to the end. And so if we keep, keep doing this process over and over again, we would collect all of these. Typically we want to run about 20 if we're doing it by hand. And then we would take the average of all of these outcomes here, the, the length of the, our response variable, which is the length of the trials. And that would, we could actually graph that out and to be able to figure out what typical would be, which would probably be, be the average. All right, so anyway, our response variable is what we're interested in. That's going to be these numbers here. Um, the outcome is going to be the outcome of each of each um, of each component. And you also have the the outcome of the trial. So there's two outcomes you can talk about. And then we're going to our y values are going to be the number of boxes, which is another way of saying the response variable. Okay, so here they actually did this for us in the book. So here's our first 10 trials using those random numbers. You can see the breakdown here of how long it took. So the fifth trial, uh, this one had a length of 18. So there were 18 boxes before they finally found that LeBron card. Of course, it's the rarest one, but LeBron was not always the last one for us to find, right? Even though you would expect it probably would be, but that's okay. Some of them started out with the LeBron card. This one actually had two LeBron cards right off the back. So anyway, kind of cool, interesting stuff. So we're going to take the these uh, response variables here. This is the length of the trials, which is what we're really interested in. We need to graph them out. So we're going to use a, a modified uh, box plot, which is how we display quantitative data. So it looks like the median, which was the 50 percentile, was five. So we would expect at the very minimum of three. I don't think any of those actually happened in three. Yeah, none of them happened in three. There were some that happened in four, though. Okay, so the minimum was four, but we would expect it's possible to do it in three, but it'd be very rare. Uh, the median, which would be like the, the typical behavior, is probably a good way of describing it since it is skewed because of the outliers. And of course it would be skewed uh, towards the right, it would be a median of five. We're going to just take the average and, just, and say the average would be uh, how we would, um, we would summarize the, the outcome with the average is how we're going to do it. Okay, moving on. So what can go wrong? Simulations show what might happen, not what will happen. So just because the first simulation we did, we had an outcome 
um, in just four, a trial length of four. It doesn't mean we should go out and buy four boxes and expect that's what's going to happen our first time. It shows all the possible outcomes, not what exactly is going to happen. And so we actually need to run uh, hundreds or thousands of simulations before we can actually really hone in on on the exact uh, the exact value, which is all really based on probability. So in many cases, it's possible to find the exact value, but simulations are helpful um, when we can't actually calculate the exact the exact uh, the pr exact probability using probability. Okay. All right. So model potential outcomes accurately. So don't imply outcomes are equally as likely. So again, if it's a 20% LeBron, make sure you assign two of them to LeBron. Um, just be careful with that. The components of the trials are equally likely, not not always the outcomes. So the components themselves, that's the numbers, you know, zero through nine, all the numbers zero through nine, they're all equally likely to occur. But whenever we assign uh, a different number of those um, values of the components to one of the possible outcomes that might, necess might necessarily not necessarily be the exact same, um, which is often the case. And then another example of that um, with, the, with the outcomes of the trial is that like rolling a six is not the, is is an equal outcome, right? So rolling a six, rolling a five are exactly the same, but rolling two sixes in a row, now that's that's difficult, that's different, right? All right, so let's go right to the assignment here. Uh, some of this stuff's kind of hard to explain, it's just easier to work out an example, so sorry about that. You can also read the chapter and try to you know, wrap your head around it. All right, number 12 says, explain why each of the following situation fails to model the real situation uh, clearly. So we use random integers two through 12 to represent the sum of, two, of the faces of two dice whenever you roll them. So whenever you two, roll two dice, that the the first dice and the second dice, like their, their values of one through six, those are random, but the sum of those two are not going to be random. Um, and let me, let me go ahead and graph that out here. So um, if we roll a one and a one, that would be a sum of two. If we roll a one and a two, that's a sum of three. A one and a three would be a sum of four. Uh, one and four is five. You can probably see the pattern, right? One and five is six and then seven. Okay. And then the other way we could do is rolling a two first and then a one it should be a three, a two and a two would be a four. You can probably see the pattern, right? Okay. Also, um, you might notice that there's going to be a pattern going actually diagonally. So five and one is one way we could get a six. We could also roll a sum of a six by a four and a two, a three and a three, a two and a four, or a one and a five. So um, it means this diagonal is also going to fill in here. So we could roll a five by rolling a four and a one, a three and a two, a two and a three, or a one and a four. And you'll see the same thing here. So uh, the most po probable outcome is actually rolling a seven. And that's why in the game of crafts and many other games, rolling a seven is going to be um, is a thing. OK, and then um, so there's actually six different ways um, that you could roll a seven. And then there's eight ways you could roll a six. There are four ways to roll a nine three ways or combinations of rolling a 10, uh, two for an 11, and just one for a 12. So the one for a 12 is just as rare as rolling um, a two because snake eyes and uh, two sixes is going to be exactly the same. There's only one possible way to get that. So the number of counts that we had for some of the dice of two, there were um, there was only one way to do that, right? To get a three, there's only two ways to get that, then three, and then four, then five. And the most common would be to roll sum of a seven, which is six, and then the numbers start going back down, right? Then it counts down five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, I knew I was gonna do that. All right, then, so the relative frequencies, if we look at all the possible outcomes, there's 36 altogether, so six times six is 36. Okay, so one divided by 36 would be a probability of 2.7. So there's only a 2.7% chance that you would roll a sum of a two. Then two out of that is gonna be, well, twice that value, roughly 5.5%. And then three out of 36 uh, or 1 12th would be 8.3%. These are all rounded values. Anyway, I'm just gonna go ahead and show them to you here. Um, and then, so the most likely is gonna be one sixth probability of rolling seven, and then the probabilities basically just reflect and you got the same thing that you had whenever you're starting out. Okay, so it just goes back down to where it started. Okay, so are are you just as likely, if you, if you assign random numbers two through 12 to represent the sums of two through 12 of two dice, the reason that doesn't work is because the probabilities are not equal. There's more ways, you're more likely to roll a seven than you are to roll a two. In fact, you're six times as likely to roll a seven than you are to roll a two because there's six times as many ways of rolling 
a sum of a seven than there is to roll a sum of a two, which is just snake eyes, right? Okay, so that's the long answer, but kind of fun. This is actually a good one because we, we will use this example quite a bit. So just a good one for you to, to have uh, for us to spend the time on. Number part B. All right, so use a random integer from zero to five to represent the number of boys in the family. All right, so uh, to do this, we're going to generate some random integers again. So we need to go to math and then probability error over there and then random integer, which is five from zero to one. So we're going to assign. Uh, so we'll let one be a boy and a, a zero to be a, uh, a girl in the family because we're, we're looking for the we're looking for the boys. So we'll look for the ones and then we want to generate a family of five. So there'll be five of them, then hit paste. We've actually done this before, but this will be like the fifth time. So we should be seeding the exact same thing, but eventually we'll match up. So define, before you actually run your simulations, you need to define what the one and what the zero stand for. So do that. All right, so the first time we only had, so out of five children, we had one boy. And then the second time we had two boys and then three boys and then three boys again, and then three again. So we can run this over and over again. Um, what you're gonna notice is that the most common would be like 50-50, right? So the most common outcomes that we would have would be two or three boys out of five, right? Because two and a half would be exactly even. So two and three would be the most common, which by the way, here we have the binomial distribution, uh, which is what we're actually doing. Uh, the rarest one would be to have no boys, which would be all girls or five boys. And notice that those are both the same probability. Uh, in fact, one and four are the same probability and two and three are the same probabilities as well. So this is actually modeled by a binomial distribution which we'll get into when we talk about probability after christmas um, but in the simulation if we did this enough times would actually approach these percentages if we did uh, you know, thousands of the simulations over and over again okay so we don't actually have to do that um, but the question is does it does it work uh, explain why the following situations fail to model the real okay so the issue here again is the fact that each one of these uh, if we just if we generate the numbers zero through five to represent the number of boys and a family of five, well, each one of the outcomes is not equally likely, right? So the most likely outcomes would be two and three. We would have to weight the numbers using these values. And so that's not how we would do it. Okay, bad simulations. Explain why each of the following case again fails to model a real situation. Uh, use a random integer from zero to nine to represent the number of heads when you toss nine coins. Okay, so the number of heads with nine coins, a four and five would be the most likely they're both 24.6% having three out of nine heads and six out of nine heads. Those are the same probabilities, 16.4 and then seven or two are the same and, and the same thing going on here. Um, you only have a 0.2% chance of having nine heads in a row or nine tails in a row, however you want to look at it. Okay. So anyway, again, given to us by the binomial distribution, the issue is the fact that each one of the um, outcomes is not as equally as likely for our components here. All right, um, I think this says, yeah, 11B. Okay, so a basketball player takes a foul shot. Look at the random uh, a random digit. Use an odd digit to represent a good shot and an even digit to represent a miss. So there are equally number of odds and evens. So we're assuming that it's a 50-50 chance of hitting a foul shot. But for each player, that's not true. Um, maybe for Shaq, he might have a 50-50 chance of hitting a foul shot. But most players are going to be much, much better than that. So we would need to know the probability of each occurrence since they're not, they're not as equally likely. We would need to know the player. Um, and so... That, that depends. All right, so use random integers from 1 to 13 to represent the denominators, or sorry, the denominations of ace, uh, 2 through 10, jack, king, queen, and king of the cards of a five poker hand. All right, so use random numbers from 1 to 13. Okay, so that's fine. Okay, so the issue with this is that whenever we draw, we're drawing without replacement. And so if we draw an ace, the probability of drawing another ace um, is not the same, right? Because there's fewer aces in the total deck, right? So we'll get into this more specifically with probability. So don't worry about it too much. Uh, but the simulation, one of the ways you can see that it breaks down is the simulation would actually allow for a hand of five aces. So we could have five ones um, that, you know, from our random numbers, but that's not even possible and um, basically, as I said before, once you draw an ace, the probability of drawing another ace goes down because there's fewer aces left in the deck. All right, so each, each drawn card is not independent to the next is essentially what we're going we're to end up getting into. 
All right, 13, wrong conclusion. Stat student properly simulated uh, the length of a checkout line in the grocery store and reported the average length of the line will be uh, 3.2 people. So that might be what we had based on the simulation, but that's not what actually is going to happen. So you're overstating the case. Uh, so simulations show what might happen, not what will happen. So what he should say is based on um, we can expect an average uh, an average length line to be about 3.2 based on our simulation. Okay, not that it will, but we can expect it on average, essentially. All right, number 17, or our, our simulation suggests that an average length of 3.2. All right, cereal. In the chapter's example, so 20% of cereal boxers were pictured with LeBron James, 30% Danic Patrick, and the rest Serena Williams. Suppose you buy five boxes of cereal. Estimate the probability you would end up with a complete set of pictures. Your simulation should have at least 20 runs. So what's nice is that our, our random integers are already... Um, they're already listed in groups of five. And so I went ahead and went through and color coded them for LeBron, Danica, and Serena. So we went ahead and um, we assigned them. So zero and one, 20% would be LeBron. That's a typo. That should be 20%. 30% are Danica and the 50% are Williams, which is five through nine. Uh, so on this one, the first trial that we had, which is a group of five, in this case, they're all the same group. It's not like we're stopping at a certain point here. Um, so the trial links are all the same, but the outcome is going to be either yes or no. So we want to circle the number, the number of these trials that actually successfully got a complete set. So the first one did, cause we have all three colors. This one did not, that one did not, uh, this one did, that one did not. Okay. So basically I'm just going to circle the ones that did. That were successful. Okay, so we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we had eight out of twenty, which is going to be, um, let me see, forty percent. All right. So based on our simulation, it would suggest forty percent. If we went out and bought um, bought five boxes of cereal, forty percent of the time we would expect to have a complete set by then. Um, meaning 60% of the time we would expect to have to keep going to buy more cereal, more than five boxes of cereal. Um, now our conclusion should be around, based on the actual probability, should be about 51%. So we got 40%. It was a little low. If we would have done like a 100, uh, at least uh, 100 trials instead of 20, then it would approach this 51%. Um, it wouldn't necessarily get there, but eventually it would get there. It's called empirical probability, by the way. All right, 18, cereal again. Suppose you really want a LeBron James picture. How many boxes of cereal, this is the geometric model, by the way, uh, would you need to buy to be pretty sure of getting at least one? So on average, how many boxes of cereal would we expect based on our simulation in order to get a, uh, a LeBron James card? So our, our simulation should have at least 10 trials. So um, we're looking for zeros and ones. So here's our first one. And that would happened again, five, this would be 10. So that, that took 10, then it took uh, two, then we have three, five. Uh, so that would be six. And then this one, it happened on the first time. And then we have basically uh, six again. And then here, oh, happened on the first time. So that'd be one. And then this would be the sixth time here. This would be the sixth again, the second one, five, six, and then seven. Okay, so do we have at least 10? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So we did. Okay, so add all those up and then we're gonna take the average. So that's gonna be 10 plus two plus six plus one plus six. That's supposed to be a six. Another one plus another six. There's some patterns there. All right, so all together we had 47. So the total number of boxes we did, we're gonna divide that by uh, our number of trials, which was 10. So finding the average in other words. So on average, it took 4.7 boxes uh, for us to find a LeBron James card. Now that's based on our simulation and our simulation was, um, there were only 10 trials. So 10 trials is not a lot. So. Um, our, our answer based on the probability would be, in case you're wondering, uh, the way that we find the expected value for a geometric model is to take the reciprocal of the probability of success. 
So the negative one power, which would be five. Uh, another way that you can actually see that is by doing one divided by 0.5 or 0.2, the probability, which is five, the same thing as a reciprocal. So that comes from the geometric model, which again, we're gonna talk about after Christmas. This is really, uh, makes you wanna get into the probability, but just, just doing simulations for now. All right, you take a quiz with uh, six multiple choice questions. After you studied, you estimated that you would have about an 80% chance of getting any, any individual question right. What are the chances of getting them all right? So run at least 20 trials. So if we have a 80% chance of getting them right, then we'll say that the only way we get them wrong, would we need to assign two digits to that. So it looks like I assigned uh, nine and eight to as or so eight and nine would be getting it wrong so zero through seven were assigned yeah let zero through seven represent a correct answer and eight and nine represent a wrong one so that would be 20 percent and 80 percent so it's very important to tell me how you assigned it so i highlighted all the wrong ones in red uh how many times do we what was the question it's a six question test all right, so I actually regroup these in groups of six just to make it easier for you uh, instead of the five, which is what it is traditionally. So we missed three on this one, missed one, missed three, missed one. All right, so we got them all right on this one. And missed two, missed one, got all those right. It's a lot easier when it's already highlighted and color coded for you. So out of 20 trials, we got one, two, three, four. So only four out of 20 which is going to be equal to one fifth, which is 20%, right? All right. So 20% of the time we got, um, we got, we got them all right, which, uh, based on the actual probabilities, it should be roughly 26.2. So again, our simulations are not showing exactly what's going to happen and not even going to show what's going to happen in the long run. Cause these are just a, a small number of simulations. We actually use computers to run thousands of simulations in an instant. So is one way that we can find out some very complicated probabilities. All right, a friend of you, uh, a friend of yours who took the multiple choice quiz in example 19 got all six questions right, but now claims to have guessed blindly on every question. If each question is offered four possible answers, do you believe her? So if she just guessed blindly, then there would be a 25% chance, um, a 25% chance of getting it right. So can she get with a 25% chance of guessing it right, all six of them right? What's the probability of that happening? Um, so we can, <laughs> I'm tempted just to find the probability by, you know, multiplying, uh, 0.25 and um, to the sixth power, which would tell you the probability is very, 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 very small. So less than, uh, less than 1%. So she's, she's full of crap. Uh, she didn't just guess, uh, which is actually kind of funny because I actually had a student who cheated on a test once and, um, I actually got to use probability. It was really funny because like <laughs> I teach stats, like I know this stuff and, uh, after we discussed the probability of her guessing all of those right, she's like, okay, yeah, fine, I got the answers. It was really fun. All right, so describe how you will simulate a component. Um, all right, so if there's a 25% 20, chance, um, because it's not 20%, uh, we, we have to use two digits. Um, we can't just assign zero and one, that would only be 20%. We can't assign zero, one, and two, that would be a 30%. So um, we're going to assign the digits as uh, zero, zero through 24 to be a correct answer. And then 25, let's try that again. So 25 through 99 is going to be a wrong answer. All right, um, describe how you simulate component. That's that right there. Describe how you simulate a trial. So we're gonna do six of them in a row. So just do six. Uh, so that's 12 integers all together, but um, so 12 integers. Using 12, a, a string of 12 random integers. Describe the response variable. So the response variable is gonna be the number um, Oh, so the only way that we, this is going to work is if, so the response variable is the number that they got, uh, how, how many times that they got them all right, um, that she got all the, the values there. So it's really, really similar to what we were talking about here, except now we're looking, we're looking for the same thing. So our response variable is if she got all of them. So if all, um, six uh, components were uh, zero, zero through 24. So it's a, it's a yes or no. Did, did were all six of the components of the trial where they 
numbers and in, random integers from zero to 24 or were they um, were they above so if they weren't if even one of them was wrong then then it would be right okay uh, all right so use a calculator to run 10 trials we're going to ra generate random integers so I'm going to grab my calculator here so I'm going to go to math probability random integers which is five we're going to go from zero to four. Oh, that makes it even easier if we're not using random integers so i'm going to go from one i guess one to four okay and we're going to let one represent a correct answer and anything else to represent a wrong answer or even better i'll just do zero to three because zero sticks out not like it really matters. And we're going to run six of them all together. So if it's a zero, that's a correct answer. So we're looking for six zeros. See if that ever happens. And we're going to run 10 of them. All right. So nope. We only got, looks like three right. Then we got two right. And then we got two right. And then one right. And then only one right. One out of six. One out, one out of six. None of them right. Okay. So we ran at least 10 of them. You don't have to actually mark all these off. Uh, that sounds kind of cruel, honestly, to have you do all that. Um, so just just write the number that they got right, I suppose, or you can just put X's on them. That's fine. I'm I'm so lazy too. I don't blame you. So we ran ten of them. Did she ever get all of them right? All of our ten simulations. I'm just gonna keep going just to see if if it ever happens. So we're looking for all zeros. Just to remind you. Ooh. I'm tired. Yeah, no, I'm not. It's it's not going to happen. It's a less than a 1% chance, like a lot less than 1%. Um, in fact, if I go back to that original uh, number that I gave you and I take the uh, reciprocal of it, that'll tell me how likely it is to happen. Okay, too far. All right, so I'm going to take this value and I'm going to take the reciprocal of it. And that means this will only happen once out of 4,096 times. So if we ran 4,096 simulations or trials in our simulation, we would expect it to happen. Oh, look, it's the same thing right? that I told you here. All right, so do you believe her? No, she's full of crap. Based on your argument of the simulation, the true probability is actually 0.024% of the time or one in that number there. And you saw how I did the math uh, behind that. Okay, so that's it. I'm going to get off. Um, basically did all of your homework for you, but you got to watch all the videos. So that's pretty well the only way to learn. All right. So see you guys. Have a good one.